Hello scholars, this is Mr. Myers doing lesson 2.10, Problems of the National Government. Make sure you take good structured notes over our objectives. We'll be looking at issues related to the budget, Congress, the presidency, and the judicial branch. So the first major problem associated with the national government that we should talk about is the budget. Uh, the biggest issue, of course, is the fact that we're spending way more money than we're bringing in. So one question that I think it's fair for conservative, fiscally minded people to ask is, is the debt way too high? How can we reduce the deficit? You can see the graphic on the far right here that the, the national debt stands at about $31.5 trillion, which is an enormous sum of money. Now, it's important to keep in mind that our federal budget every year is over $4 trillion, um, but it's still growing and growing and growing, and many people think that the debt is getting out of control. Another issue related to the budget is taxation. Do Americans pay their fair share, right? I'm sorry, do wealthy Americans pay their fair share? Of course, we have a progressive tax system, but some people argue that the top 1% should be paying way more in taxes than uh, they currently are. And another issue that has been certainly uh, a topic of discussion in, in the spring and, and summer of 2023 is the debt ceiling. Uh, I had mentioned again that uh, Speaker McCarthy and President Biden had recently worked out a deal on that. Um, um, but that's continually a, a political football that uh, is being tossed around that um, could have disastrous consequences if, if uh, failure to raise the debt ceiling is not reached. In addition to budget issues and concerns, we also have issues related to our Congress. Probably one of the biggest ones is how we can prevent uh, gerrymandering. In a different lecture, I talked a little bit about this process, and you saw this graphic and, and, and ways that districts can be very um, craftily drawn in such a way as to benefit one particular political party over another. Uh, recently, in the early summer of 2023, the Supreme Court actually issued somewhat of a surprise ruling, uh, striking down an Alabama congressional map that, uh, according to the Supreme Court, uh, disenfranchised African American voters. So it does look like the Supreme Court, at least in this case, has um, uh, said that this one particular map is, is problematic. Now, it's important to remember that most of the apportionment and redistricting that happens is done by our legislators. They're done by state legislatures. And so it's not surprising that if the Missouri state legislature is controlled by Republicans, that they're going to draw maps in such a way as to favor the Republican Party. Uh, and this is actually true in most states. So the process by which we draw districts might be something worth considering. Another issue is the use of the filibuster, and there's been a lot of talk in recent years about whether or not uh, Democrats in particular should try to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate. Some people argue that it's an important check on the power of the majority to make sure that major important pieces of legislation have bipartisan support. Uh, other people would argue that it's just highly undemocratic, and it tends to favor the party that wants tradition and less change, right? Democrats tend to want more change and reform. Republicans are more concerned about tradition and the status quo. And if the filibuster prevents legislation, it inherently uh, benefits the party that that uh, wants tradition and status quo as opposed to wants change. So I think it's fair to say that the filibuster, you know, disproportionately uh, benefits the Republican Party over the Democratic Party. To provide a little bit more of an historical perspective, the filibuster hasn't always existed. It's not written into the Constitution. There's, there's nothing that the Founding Fathers said about the use of the filibuster. And it might be worth noting that some of the most famous filibusters in American history have been used to try to prevent civil rights legislation from passing. Another issue related to the Congress is the fact that the District of Columbia does not have full representation in the House or the Senate. The District of Columbia has uh, what's called a shadow delegate. They are allowed to participate in committee hearings and debate on the floor uh, and can actually do everything but actually vote. If you look at the license plate for the District of Columbia, it actually says taxation without representation, which of course was an important rallying cry during the American Revolution. And of course, that's exactly what is happening to them. They are being taxed, yet they do not have a vote in the House of Representatives. The District of Columbia's population is about 690,000 people. When you consider the fact that Vermont and Wyoming have 645,000 and 575,000 people respectively, uh, that's you know something to consider. Um, and of course, many Democrats would love to see the District of Columbia become a state because they think it would be left-leaning and that would be two more senators to add to their mix. You also have Puerto Rico, which is considered an unincorporated territory. They exist in some kind of like purgatory state uh, in between uh, statehood and uh, sovereignty. Now, after 1945, there was a law that was passed that said that anyone born in Puerto Rico is a U.S. citizen, so they do enjoy the benefits of U.S. citizenship, but they don't enjoy the benefits of full statehood, nor do they enjoy the benefits of being a fully independent sovereign nation. Like I said, they're kind of 
stuck in between. Every so often, Puerto Ricans will hold referendums to determine whether or not they want to change their relationship uh, vis-a-vis uh, to the United States, but um, historically they have wanted to maintain the current relationship that they have. If Puerto Rico were to become a state, they would be one of the larger ones, or at least kind of in the middle of the pack, with about 3.2 million people. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of the issues associated with the presidency. So one of the ones that uh, is often talked about is whether or not the Electoral College should be changed or eliminated. It's really important for everyone to know that no other system in the entire <laughs> world has a system like, like, like ours. Uh, we were torn between whether or not we wanted to have a popular vote to determine the president or whether the president should be appointed or chosen, and our compromise was the Electoral College. Some people think that it causes us to focus on just a few states that are called swing states. They, they tend to be purple on the electoral maps, right? If um, Democrats are blue states and Republicans are red states, those purple states are Ohio, Pennsylvania, you know, Florida to a certain degree. Um, and what ha tends to happen is that an enormous amount of uh, attention is, is lavished on those few states uh, that could swing the election. California is probably not going to vote for a Republican. And at least, you know, for a while, Texas is probably not going to be voting Democratic, right? So um, with most states being solidly blue or solidly red, the Electoral College it tends to have people focus on just a few of those states. Nearly 10% of presidential elections have been won by a person who did not win the popular vote, and that's a quirk of our system. You can see on the right that Al Gore won about a half a million more votes than George W. Bush, yet George W. Bush became president and served two terms, and Hillary Clinton actually won 2.9 million more votes than Donald Trump uh, in the 2016 election, yet Donald Trump won the presidency. Another issue associated with the presidency is whether or not the president has too much power to, to surveil and to make war. Uh, those are questions uh, that certainly exist in the wake of Vietnam and uh, the war on terror uh, and the use of drone attacks and, and, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Passage of the Patriot Act and enhanced interrogation techniques, all of these are issues related to the imperial presidency. Okay, the last area that we're going to talk about in terms of problems of the national government is the judicial branch. And I would argue that in 2023, this is one of the more um, uh, widely talked about areas of the national government. One basic issue that people discuss is whether or not federal judges should serve life terms. When the Founding Fathers wrote the Constitution, the average lifespan probably wasn't much past 50 or 60 years old. Um, and today, with advances in medicine, it's not uncommon to have a Supreme Court justice serve four or more decades, you know, well into their 90s um, on the bench. Term limits would certainly solve, you know, that problem. Another area that people often discuss is whether or not we should be electing judges as opposed to appointing them. Some people think it's way more democratic to elect judges, um, that the will of the people will be heard. Other people would counter that by saying, you know, do we really want to bring more money and, and, and politics into uh, our system, especially in terms of the judicial branch? In Missouri, we have a hybrid system. We don't directly elect our um, uh, judges, but many states do. In the St. Louis viewing area, it's not uncommon to see political attack ads for Illinois judges that are running for office. Some people simply think adding more money and politics into the process is, is not the, the answer there. Now, a somewhat controversial issue that's been talked about, at least in some Democratic circles, is whether or not Democrats should try to pack the court. Uh, packing the court refers to adding justices to the total number in order to benefit the party that is in power that would get to nominate those justices. Uh, the most famous example of this is when FDR tried to pack the court during the New Deal. He wanted to add six justices to bring the total to 15. The context there is that this, the Supreme Court was striking down key pieces of his uh, New Deal legislation, and he wasn't very happy about that. He claimed that they were too old and that we should bring some younger justices in to share the workload a little bit better. Did not go over well. Even you know members of his own party, even Democrats, were like, yeah, I'm not sure this is a super great idea. Now, some context to understand the arguments among some Democrats uh, today would be that five uh, of our justices, they tend to be very conservative. You can see pictures of them in the top right. Five justices on the Supreme Court have been nominated by presidents who actually lost the popular vote. Since they serve a, a life appointment, some people think that that's inherently unfair and undemocratic. Uh, in addition, Merrick Garland was a Supreme Court nominee uh, 
that was uh, nominated by Barack Obama. And for 293 days, Republicans refused to allow a vote on Merrick Garland's nomination. And of course, then the 2016 election happened, Donald Trump won, and the Republicans got that pick. So many Democrats are upset about the fact that a majority of justices on the Supreme Court have been appointed by people who did not win the popular vote, and they think that maybe they should expand the number of justices on the bench. Of course, Republicans could then just wait until they're in power and add even more justices to the mix, and next thing you know, we're in a Supreme Court justice arms race. So again, not sure what the answer there is. The last major thing we're going to talk about is the fact that public confidence in the Supreme Court is way down. Only 25% of Americans really have faith in the Supreme Court. You can see that graphic in the bottom right. Uh, there's a couple different reasons for that. One of them is that the Supreme Court has seemed to be out of step um, in terms of public opinion on a couple important decisions. Uh, recently overturning Roe v. Wade, which to many people was kind of the settled law of the land. Uh, consistently, a majority of Americans, you know, two-thirds or more, support some access to to abortion rights and uh, and in this Supreme Court decision was a little bit out of step with uh, public opinion on that in addition there was a leak to that uh, case before that happened and that seemed also somewhat uh, partisan and political for a group of people who's not supposed to be partisan and political. Uh, also, gun rights have been expanded at a time of increasing mass shootings. Um, and there's also some ethical concerns associated with, in particular, Justice Clarence Thomas receiving and not disclosing certain gifts uh, and some concerns about his wife and activity his wife was involved in. Now, uh, the Supreme Court does not subscribe to an ethical code. All other federal judges have an ethical code that they have to subscribe to. Some people argue that uh, if there was any group of judges who needed an ethical code, it's ones that serve for life, right? They don't understand why the Supreme Court is um, opposed to um, subscribing to a code of ethics that all other federal judges subscribe to. That also shakes confidence in the court. I hope you learned a little bit about some of the issues facing the national government. As always, please bring your questions to class.